Oh man, I'm so excited to share today's episode with you. I recently got to sit down and perform an interview with Dr. Kathleen Smith. She works for the Bowen Institute and she wrote a book recently called Everything Isn't Terrible. And the book addresses anxiety. Now, I know there are a lot of anxious people in the world right now. You take into consideration COVID and the stress and the pressure that that's put so many of us under with homeschooling and the economy kind of struggling in different ways. You've got elections, you've got people staying home and they're quarantined, and it's just a really stressful and anxious time at the moment that we recorded this. And so having one of the world's top experts on anxiety sit down and give some really practical and actionable tips on how you can better manage your anxiety so you can be your very best self in the relationships and areas of your life that are most important to you was phenomenal. Now, something really special about this interview is that it was recorded live in the Epic Marriage Club. I'm recording all of my podcast interviews live in that group now, which is really exciting for the members. So if you want to either watch this full recording, because what you're going to get today is just an excerpt of the full interview. If you want to drop in and get the full recording, or if you want to come and participate in future recordings, we do at least one of these per month in the Epic Marriage Club. Just go to epicmarriageclub.com you'll get to see all the amazing benefits that are involved with being a member. And the cost is less than a movie ticket every month, or if you sign up for the annual membership, it's less than the cost of one therapy appointment. So I hope you check that out, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Guys, one of my favorite things in the world to do is to meet new relationship nerds, <laughs> people who are obsessed with, with relationships like I am, and find out like what their passion is, what their niche is, and then bring them to you. And I feel so lucky. Um, something that we've been talking a lot about like on the podcast, and we talk about it a lot in the Epic Wives Experiment, is uh, anxiety and overfunctioning and underfunctioning. And a lot of people have written me and expressed desire to learn more about like how to manage their anxiety and how to stop being an overfunctioner or an underfunctioner. And so I went out and I started reading books. And I found my new favorite book. It's called Everything Isn't Terrible. It's by Kathleen, Dr. Kathleen Smith, and she's right here next to me. And Hi, Nate. <laughs> we get to talk to you today. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you for being here. Well, I'm happy to be talking with you. And this is one of my favorite topics. So I could just riff forever. You'll have to stop me at some point. <laughs> oh, great. I'll, I'll pump the brakes if we get going too fast. <laughs> but let's can we start at like 101? What is anxiety? Because I think a lot of people have a lot of misperceptions around like they think it's just a feeling. But what what is anxiety if you could just describe that for us yeah so the definition i was taught and the one i use is it's uh it's your response as a human to a real or a perceived threat and you know it's something different than anxiety disorder right i think we tend to conflate the two two words or terms but anxiety is just a built-in response every organism has to danger whether it's real or whether it's not real and that's really great for surviving <laughs> and thriving, but it's it's really bad when when you lose uh, that perception of what's real and what's not. Mm. So, so a lot of the times it sounds like the reason that anxiety does damage to us and to our relationships is because we're detecting a threat when no threat is actually present. Yeah, or we, yeah, we lose sight of the facts and we lose sight of our own capability to deal with the reality. And that's when we tend to kind of shift into these automatic responses that work for a little while, but kind of get us into trouble in the long run. Hmm. Tell me more about that. How do, how do these re automatic responses get us into trouble? Yeah, you know, the theory, the psychotherapy theory I was trained in, which is called Bowen theory, sort of purports that humans aren't very creative. We kind of only have three or four things that we do when we get anxious. And it's really useful to be able to recognize them. You know, one is to the the flight, right? If you're thinking fight or flight, we avoid, we distance. Um, another is to fight, engage in conflict when we feel threatened. Um, another is to kind of pull other people in and seek allies um, <laughs> to kind of navigate a threat. And then the last thing, which we're going to be talking today, is this kind of seesaw effect where one person becomes over responsible for the other and then the other one becomes more helpless and less responsible. And that dynamic sort of calms things down in the short term, mm. uh, but it can become locked in and it can become hard for people to do something different. 
why is that a natural response for us? Like why, why when somebody feels threatened or if somebody feels anxious, do they have this, do, do we often have this desire to overfunction or to start taking responsibility for things that are not ours or the opposite under function? Yeah. Well, I think Dr. Bowen would have said that it has a lot to do with our positions in a group or in a family. You know, if you're the oldest sibling or you, you know, had a mother who was a, a leader and sort of took over all the time, you might gravitate towards being the one who takes over um, when things get tense and somebody else in the family might gravitate towards backing off or shutting down and letting you do that. And that that sort of dynamic uh, stabilizes things. And so people find that it does work. It does calm things down temporarily, uh, but it doesn't help you learn to step back and it doesn't help the other person learn to become a more capable human. And so I think it has a lot to do with sort of w how you grew up and what was your position in your own family um, because everybody can over over function but I think those of us who are helpers tend to to lean in that direction a little bit more than others maybe yeah I think initially when you start over functioning at least when I start over functioning it feels good it feels like I'm oh, being yeah. the hero it feels like I'm being the savior I'm Mr. Dependable everybody can count on me I can solve all the problems I'm always reliable um, but then it, it kind of starts to gradually turn into this like unsettling resentment that just permeates all of my interactions with people and my energy gets sucked dry. And all of a sudden, like, I just feel exhausted and tired and, and I'm short tempered with everybody. And it's, it's doesn't take long for me to like realize that I've been over functioning for a while because at first it feels great, but not so much down the road. Yeah. I mean, you wonder why <laughs> everyone isn't stepping up and it's because you always do, you know, I have, I have a friend group, that I'm in where I used to, well, back in pre-COVID times, you know, I used to be the one who always organized everyone or said, you know, here's where we're going to eat dinner. Or I was kind of the, the person doing that. And I got frustrated. I wondered, why aren't other people willing to do this? And it was because we had shifted into this dynamic. Um, and I was equally responsible, if not more so than everyone else for, for ending up you know, with us functioning that way. <laughs> but I think it's hard to see sometimes. You just assume people are you know, they don't want to help or that they aren't capable, but it has a lot to do with your own behavior. That's really interesting too, that it, it kind of, <clears throat> when you slip into this coping mechanism that you start to see people in the worst light, like you assume the worst of them. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's what anxiety has us do. Anxiety asks lots of why questions, lots of cause and effect questions, like why is this happening? Whose fault is this? Uh, and those tend to lead towards blaming a person. And so, you know, when we're we're caught in that cause and effect thinking, we tend to make the other person the villain or the person who's slacking or not putting in the effort, which is pretty easy to do. Okay, so if we identify... So anybody who listening identifies as like an overfunctioner, let's start there. Um, and they are making, they're judging their partner, they're feeling burned out, they're becoming resentful. They've got the, if I don't do it, it's nobody will kind of mentality. Um, if I, if I stepped out and stopped doing everything for everybody, their lives would fall apart. You know, this kind of martyr complex. Mm -hmm. Where do you, how do you fix that? How do you get out of that? What's, what's a good strategy to start working out of that? Sure. Well, I think the first thing is to not feel like you need to teach other people how to become more responsible. You know, keep the focus on yourself and on what you're doing and let the other person be responsible for themselves. And the first thing you do is just observe. Can you go throughout your day and notice every little thing that you do um, for other people that they can completely do for themselves? You know, I will, <laughs> I hear stories of people, they say, you know, I get to the end of the driveway and I tell my husband, to turn right, even though he's, he knows where we're going. Like, why is that an automatic thing? Right. Or, yeah. you know, I tell someone they need to go to bed at night because it's getting late. Well, that's not your responsibility. You know, you just decide when you need to, to go to bed. I mean, if it's, if it's your kid, it's your responsibility, right. but if it's like your partner, right. You don't need to do that. You're um, going to be tired in the morning if you don't go to bed yeah. right now. And so, no, you know, there's nothing wrong with helping someone out or supporting them, but you know, you have to ask yourself, is it really about helping or is it about just calming me down and helping me manage the stress that I'm feeling that day or in that moment? And I think a lot of the time it's more about the latter than it is about actually 
pitching in, <laughs> you know? And so just to just the simple routines, the simple chores, you know, it can show up in your conversations. You know, I watch my emails. I'll say things like, no worries, or, you know, I'll apologize for things I don't need to apologize for. And that's me being over responsible for people's emotions, right? It's not my responsibility whether somebody worries or not. You know, that's that's on them. But so it reflects or it comes out in our language so easily a lot of the time. So I think, you know, the, the small things you do, how you speak to other people, you know, can you notice when you're you're being responsible for the thoughts, emotions, behaviors of other people. And that those are all opportunities to step back a little bit and see what happens. So noticing is a first step. So I, I know that one of the first things that people are going to bump into at, if they're used to being over functioners is when you have to let somebody else fail or when you have to let somebody else figure out how to do something their way on their timeline, it can actually cause you more anxiety. And so what do you do in that situation where it's like, this is this is a way you manage your anxiety and the way to solve it is to cause yourself more like how do you how do you lean into that and and really do it successfully? Yeah, well, I think you have to lean into the discomfort, which sounds <laughs> terrible, right? But that's the only way you find a different way to calm yourself down. I think having a plan saying, okay, this is going to make me feel really distressed to watch this person be less efficient than I, <laughs> you know, can I, can I check out and take some deep breaths or go take a walk? You know, if you can't be in the room with them, just the, the simple things and the other ways that we, we can calm ourselves down, you know, but I think also exercising that muscle of just being in the discomfort increases your tolerance uh, for not overfunctioning and for letting people kind of flail around a little bit, you know? Um, yeah. I can give an example, you know, I'm um, an only child and my mom died when I was in college and she was very much sort of the leader in our family. And I watched my, you know, my dad struggle for several years after she died. And I was so over-functioning in that relationship. I, I assume my dad couldn't do certain things, needed my advice about things. But my dad was an adult, right? And over time, you know, thinking about this concept, you know, my dad has surprised me with the capability, you know, people are more capable than we give them credit for. <laughs> and they actually are much better at navigating their own challenges than we are because they they know more of the reality than than we do of their lives. And so it's so freeing over time, even though it might be uncomfortable in the moment to step back and let people be in charge of their lives. And it makes the relationship so much richer. You know, mm -hmm. you enjoy being around people more, the less responsible you feel for them. That's why we like our friends so much because they're not our family, <laughs> right? Um, so I think, um, you know, I, to, just to give you one other example, I compare it to, you know, when athletes do high altitude training. Um, to, I'm going to butcher the science of this, but, you know, no, you to, to sort of increase their their. I guess it's their red blood cell count and they perform at a higher rate for a couple weeks after they go back to compete in a normal elevation. And so I think of this practice of being uncomfortable, doing something different to manage your anxiety is kind of that high altitude training because especially in your family, if you can overfunction less in your family, you can do it anywhere. I think that really is the hardest mm -hmm. place to to step back from that habit. So Look, I am a firm believer that most couples don't need therapy to have a great marriage, but it's incredibly rare that you'll ever get the type of marriage that you're capable of without a little bit of guidance and encouragement. There's just too much working against you, whether it's the fact that you didn't grow up with good examples of marriage or the terrible stuff that we get exposed to from Hollywood and reality TV, or just the fact that you're two imperfect humans trying to create an amazing life together, even though nobody has ever taught you how to do that. Now, I'm a firm believer that working on your marriage shouldn't have to feel like work. And that's exactly why I created the Epic Marriage Club. Here's how it works. You get regular monthly workshops and trainings from the top marriage experts in the world. Then every single week, I transform those lessons into an actionable experiment that we'll do together because you only get results when you take action. And you'll be doing these experiments with an amazing community of awesome couples that care as much about having a great marriage as you do. 
Plus, I'll do a monthly Q&A session to make sure that you never get stuck or hung up on anything. It's literally everything you need to have a truly epic marriage. And the best part? It's freaking fun. You get all that and a whole bunch of other awesome stuff that I haven't mentioned yet for the price of a movie ticket. So go sign up right now at epicmarriageclub.com. Look, I am a 